Should it be drinks off the table, or do you think this is all right? It's quite well, civilised, isn't it? I quite it? like it, because it's almost like we're in a bar here. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Leighton's Bar. On the show. <laughs> <laughs> What's up guys and welcome back to What's In Your Kit Bag. Today I'm, I'm on the sofa. We're not like standing up or like awkwardly positioned around the table. We're actually just chilling and having a beer. This is Dave Ellison. How's it going? What, what was this again? Oh. It was like passion fruit or something? Passion West, fruit IPA? West India pale ale? I don't know. We're it's getting good, them mixed though. up. It's good. It's, it's got nice. a kick. It's tasty. I should time lapse this and just get... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> like it's going to end up a complete mess at the end. So, David, well, you describe yourself as a filmmaker, a director, but not a DP. That's right. I think DOP to me means you should be able to go up to someone and say, um, I want this lit, like that scene in Blade Runner, or whatever film you want to pick out, and they can go, all right, cool, well, we need a HMI here, and we need a pile light there, and da-da-da-da-da. So, I don't want to put myself under that bracket where people would expect that of me, because I can't do that to that degree. I can light stuff reasonably well but I don't um, you know there's working with people like Mike Mike Staniforth the DOP and so forth um, seeing how he works you know you can say things like that to him and he's got it and he comes up with techniques that I, I don't know about would never have thought about so I would never want to put myself in that bracket and have that responsibility also yeah. I don't I don't want to be a DOP um, apart from lighting my own stuff I would never want to be out there you know, making other people's stuff look great. I, want to, I just want to make my own stuff look great, basically. So it's a bit of a self-indulgent thing. So what has been your career path from, say, coming out of education? Like, we educated in film school? And then how did you get to sort of where you are? Well I, well, I studied graphic design for, God, how long would it be now? Four and a half years in college. <laughs> I, I stayed doing something that I thought, I'm probably not going to wind up doing this. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've always wanted to be in film. I mean, I've wanted to be in feature films since like the beginning, but um, I didn't know what the path was. Uh, it took me a, a while to figure it all out. Um, so I did five years of graphic design, came out of that, couldn't get a job. Um, so I, I, was, I was literally scratching on for six months while I got myself sorted. And then I worked for a company that's, I don't think they're going in Manchester anymore, they're called Channel M. This is showing my age now. <laughs> Channel Manchester they were called. And oh God, it sucked. Uh, but it was, it was basically a news channel, news and uh, lifestyle. And um, I would go in as a freelance camera operator. Okay. And I met a guy there called Matt Bloom. Matt's currently still a friend of mine. And he's, he's working, um, doing a lot of um, uh, high-end uh, kids' TV pieces. And um, basically, he'd been set up through the Prince's Youth Trust. Got right. a, got a um, what's it called? A grant, grant a grant yeah, and a loan yeah. out of them. Told me the path that he took. And I thought, oh, shit, I can do the same. So I did. So... Went to Prince's Trust, managed to get money out of my local council. I bought a Canon XL1. This is how old yeah. I am. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm 38. I think uh, yeah. I might have used them on one job just before <laughs> it like, disappeared off oh, the face of the earth. I mean, you know, see, this is the thing. What makes me laugh, you know, I was talking to a mate of mine about them the other day, and I was saying what, what was great about those cameras were, <clears throat> in comparison to, like, you know, when the 5D came out and the A7s yeah. and all these new cameras and everything, the, five, the, the, uh, the, the XL1 was very difficult to make look anything than what it was. It was a broadcast camera and that was it. So if you wanted to make it look like film, it was so difficult. Mm. But, you know, back then I was figuring out how to do it through grading and just things like sticking two, three, five borders on things that you shot, which nobody else was doing at the time. Well, you know, few and far between anyway. So it was easier to make the low end digital look like film back then. Not many people were doing it. And now everybody's doing it. And now everything looks great. So 
competition's much fiercer now as a result of kit. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. But so even back, like <coughs> when you were first experimenting with cameras, mm -hmm. you were always going for that filmic look. Always going for cinematic. And maybe has that led you down the path of where you've ended up with cameras at yeah. this moment in time? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, it's been a lot of experimentation. Um, the first truly cinematic thing that I managed to pull off was short film I did called The Insane, which won a 2008 Comic Con prize for best suspense and horror category. Mm, cool. And uh, that was shot on a DSR 500. So the old DSR. school, oh, yeah, wow. old yeah, school okay. DV cam with this big fucker here. And, <laughs> and uh, what was the lens now? It was a 18 times Canon lens. But we figured out, so we shot this thing in, um, oh, what was it called? Uh, Victoria Station in Manchester. And we figured yeah. out that if you Scott shot on the on the long end of the lens city. for for as much as you, could, as you could as you could get in a uh, long location with a lot of perspective, you'd get depth of field. Ah, I, I remember that like the first videos I used to watch on YouTube was how to get mm. the 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 depth the depth of field cinematic yeah. look, uh, and it was always with your yeah big camcorder. That's it. Get as far back That's as you can, <laughs> zoom right the way in, and then yeah. you're playing with about that. I mean, much. at that point, I didn't even know what depth of field was. It got explained to me multiple times, mm. and I still couldn't figure it out. Oh, oh got it. So um, you know, uh, it was it wasn't until we were shooting our guy in this horror movie so it was kind of like a Max Payne type dude with a raincoat and fire axe and he's walking down the tracks yeah. and we shot it long lens was like oh wow everything's compressed it's like Michael Mann and we had these like red spots from the signal lights we're like that's it that's the film look and I still couldn't figure out how we'd done it <laughs> just like all I know is you get as far away from me as you can and I'll zoom in on you that's yeah. the way it works and um, then when the 5D came out and suddenly you had a large format sensor that just instantly made the depth of field so narrow so you've gone the other end of the spectrum there with the 5D. You've mm -hmm. got was that was that actually the jump? You went from those <clears throat> very small sensor cameras well, into a full frame camera. You see, the, the funny thing is, right? I bought the 5D Mark II not for filming. I bought it for photography because I was it's hugely into my landscape photos. I've not, I don't do it as much now. I think I burnt myself out on it. But I was going hiking like every other weekend, going to the top of Snowdon and taking photos. Look at this thing, it's ace. I bought it, 21 megapixel sensor, and I thought, this is smoking. And I was already hearing about the video side of it. Yeah. And at this point, I still had my DSR 500. Now nah, it's all gonna be on this, and it's still with tapes and so forth. So I, um, I, heard, I heard a few things about it, and I still didn't click. And I was working with a guy, and we were filming music concerts up and down the country. And who are we filming now? I'm pretty sure it was Echo and the Bunny Men. Oh wow! I know, yeah. yeah. And, he, and, he, <laughs> and he basically said, uh, "I've heard this thing shoots good video. Let's stick it behind the drummer and see what we get." I was like, "Okay, no worries." So we did it, and I didn't hear another word. And then yeah. two weeks later, he rang me up and he went, "Get down here and have a look at this." He checked out the footage, and it was like, "That's off that 5D." No way! And suddenly, everything was being shot on that. And there. That must, I, when was that? Like 2012? That was just as it. Sort no, of... no, it was before that. It was 2000, and it was either 2008 or 2009. Yeah. Oh yeah, the like that revolution yeah, happened. Yeah. Maybe when I was shooting with Z1 still. That's right, because they were out at the time. Yeah. But the, it, it it was in there, and it, and it was there to be used, but no one was touching it, and not even not even myself. Even I was kind of like, ah, oh, it's probably gonna suck. Yeah. Even though for years I'd been saying to friends of mine, I'd been saying, wouldn't it be great if you had a, a like a a digital camera? And instead of just taking one frame every second, took 25, and then you've got, you know, and then I, this thing did it, and I'm like, whatever. You could have started that. <laughs> no, yeah. And then what was the dude's name? Was it Shane? Shane? Oh, the DOP got screamed at by Christian Bale. Hilbert. Hilbert. Shane Hilbert. He was the one who really jumped on the 5D bandwagon early. Yeah. I think he did it before Philip Bloom did, and then Philip Bloom became the UK's version of that. He shot um, a film about American soldiers. Uh, I had it on Act of Valor. I yes, think that's yeah, maybe yeah. It. And that's that exactly. was. Um, in the press for sort of being the first 5D yeah. feature film or something like that. And House, the TV show House with Hugh Laurie. They did a they, they did a full episode on 5D, and suddenly everyone's doing it. I mean, it wasn't great in low light, you know. Uh, I, I did stick it on auto ISO for a laugh, and you know, it still picked stuff up. And I suppose technically it was usable, but it was filled with noise. But mm. it, I just, it just blew me away. And what and the second thing that blew me away was I started working with um, with a band that broke up called Pegasus Bridge and a friend of mine his son was in the band he basically said do you want to work on a music video for him I was like yeah yeah cool there was a, there was a stills photographer there uh, this this girl called Rosie and she was shooting stills with the prime lenses that you could get for the 5D so like the Canon 85mm uh, L lenses 
and I stuck those on and then straight away it's like, oh my God, it's like the long lens yeah. stuff we were trying to get with the DSR, but you can get it much closer. Everything's shallow. Getting those lenses, it was just bang on. And as soon as I figured that out, it's like, right, I got this, I got this lick now. I know how to do it. And um, yeah, just um, that, that was the first intro into, into decent cine. And I think the, thing, the only thing that I mourn is I wish it had come earlier because I wish we could have shot the insane. And yeah. the, all the earlier stuff with those cameras. I, I look at I look at the guys who are you know, you know doing the kind of stuff when I was at that age doing that now, and I think you guys are so lucky having all this stuff. You've got cinema quality gear, you know. There's gimbals, there's drones, there's all this stuff. It wasn't there when I was going. It was only just slowly breaking into that point. And you have to be a bit more creative yeah, with yeah, your filmmaking. Absolutely, which is good. I mean, it's great to have have boundaries. I think because you wind up pushing yourself more. I think. Yeah. But um. Well, yeah. Did. You, did you focus more on story and concept back then? Because I think uh, th some of that has, has lost a bit because we focus way too much on, oh, we need a gimbal for this. Yeah. We, uh, we need that camera to do it. Yeah. Whereas back when you were very limited, you were just like, okay, here's the story. Yeah, now yeah. we've got we've to focus on telling it. Yeah. Rather I than... think, yeah, but not me. <laughs> 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 and the reason is, so there were a lot of short films coming out and they were pretty... Well done. There were, there were some ones that were shocking. There were, you know, more often than not, they'd be about you know someone dying in a council flat, and you know, and it was very grim and very Shane Meadows slash, um, you know, um, what's the dude's name we just made? I am Daniel Blake, Ken Loach, very Ken, yeah. very Ken Loach type material, mm. which which the Northwest loved. But for us, it was more about visuals. We were trying to jump on the visual yeah. bandwagon, and no one was doing the kind of stuff that we wanted to do. So the insane was very much like a survival horror film. Yeah. So it was like Resident Evil, Silent Hill. No one had done that. You know what I mean? So when we did it and we got it out there, everyone was going, oh shit, and kind of like, no one's done this before. But everyone's doing it now. So I'm not saying that we were the first to do <laughs> it, but we were. So how did you then transition into where you are now? Because there's a big gap between a 5D and what's in your kit bag. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, I mean, I hadn't used the Red. No, I had. Sorry. Sorry. In 2008, I set up a company called Red Handed Cameras, which was renting out Red, uh, the Red One when that oh, had right. first come out. So these things are huge. So did you like, jump onto Red as soon as it yeah, came yeah. out? Yeah, yeah. Well, basically, I was doing the feature film with uh, a company, and we were. I was talking to the DOP about it. And I said, it'd be great to shoot on Red. And as we talked more and more, we all said, well, we've all got a little bit of money saved. Why don't we pool it? And set up a red camera hire company because mm. nobody else is doing it in the northwest. And we did it, and it didn't work out well because um, <laughs> everyone was frightened of the red at that point. Yeah, I remember it was it was big, bulky, and it didn't yeah. work so well. It, you um, see, the problem was you had to have a very specific workflow approach to it, and if you didn't, what you'd get at the back end was kind of sucked really. Like there was a lot of BBC cameramen using it, and they were used to shooting on thirty-five mil, and they were used to shooting thirty-five mil at a certain you know exposure level. And then going, well, I can push that two or three stops in the lab and it'll be fine. And when they tried to do that with the red and suddenly it went noisy as, they were like, this system doesn't work. That was, that was what they did. They underexposed it. To, they were used to underexposing film and then dragging it back out in nice. the lab. And we were telling them, you can't do that with this. You've got to shoot as though you plan to keep that the way it is on the day. Don't mess around with it too much. And um, that's what scared them off. So red was a bit of a pariah for a while. It was only used by a lot of fashion guys and short filmmakers and stuff like yeah. that, but they were still building the brand. So we had this camera, we couldn't get it out the door. Uh, we had to sell the company. And I'm kind of gutted because by the time we got enough kits to be able to have a full shooting kit, that's when we sold. So right. I, I never really shot much yeah. with that. We shot a little bit, shot a few pieces for HBO down in London, but we soon came to realize what the limitations of the camera system was. And, but I did love it. I loved the image. I thought, wow, this looks like film. It really, yeah. I, I can't even explain why. I still think the red one's got a fantastic sensor. The MX, uh, even the original red one sensor, there's something very 35 mil about it, right. even though it's a, a touch on the noisy side. So, but it, it really did kind of, you know, set me off. I, I thought, I've, I've got to get something like this down the line. Then Black Magic came out, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll go Black Magic. And um, so Black Magic came and like turned everyone's idea of shooting raw on mm. its head mm -hmm. because before that it's very expensive yeah. with the red red cinema systems and then black magic kind of disrupt the market That's by it. making very cheap products with packing a lot yeah, of punch and yeah. firepower in them no absolutely 
so but every again everyone was buying that and I wanted to try and set myself apart so the first the first real experience I had with the newer reds was um uh, this is DSCM the D, D, DSCM1 so yeah. this was the next camera up from the Red 1 MX sensor which was so this was the first Red Epic that came yeah. out so I didn't I didn't have this camera I shot a couple of uh, property videos down in London we had, it was fully crewed and the uh, DOP, Adam Etherington, owned a Red Epic. I edited everything and just looked at what you had to work with and just thought, this is great. Yeah. You can just push and pull this image so much. It's so rich. There was a glossiness to it, and I just thought, this is just amazing. So uh, I was living in Edinburgh at the time when we were doing that, and then I moved back to Manchester because I couldn't get any work up in Edinburgh and um, started working with a marketing agency, being their video department so to speak and mm -hmm. I just said screw this I'm going to live on beans on toast for as long as I can and just save up for this camera because so. at that moment in time that was the ultimate yeah for you exactly I mean at the same time you know the RE Alexa was out but it was out of everybody else's price range um, and I thought it was too big and for me too big and bulky I looked at the I think the thing I like about the red is it's it's very much like there's not much difference between that and a, a 5D Mark II or a, a, a A7 a7, A7S. A7S2. Yeah. They're the, the, the exact same machine, and they've got the same form factor and same everything. The only difference is one can shoot slow-mo, it's a bigger, richer picture, but at the end of the day, they do the same, and I, and I like that form factor, because I came from a photography background. Mm. I just like the way that works. I'm not a massive fan of ENG. I think it's got its place, but in terms of trying to make ENG look cinematic, I think it's really tough. Um, I think you're better off with a cinematic camera to begin with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we so we, we shot these pieces on the red, thought it was amazing, saved up the money. Then I realized, and this is the problem with the red and probably any kind of like high-end camera system yeah. like that is, you can't just buy the camera and go, that's it. Suddenly your tripod's not good enough, suddenly your lenses aren't good enough, suddenly everything's not good enough and you've got to go, shit. And it becomes a bit of a bottomless pit. So you're saying like once you get that big camera, that high-end, mm -hmm. everything else has to become high-end around it? It doesn't have to, it just makes your life a hell of a lot easier. I mean, there are certain things that, that, you know, like there are a lot of guys out there, they'll buy a red and then they'll just use Canon still lenses, like the L yeah. lenses that you can get, which are about like, you know, depending on which one you get, like one to 2,000 pounds of pop. But you see so many people saying, why would you spend 50 grand on a camera yeah. and then put less than a grand's it's, worth it's of absolute, glass in It's of absolutely it? true. I mean, um, you know, don't get me wrong. Like I said, we shot the insane on a DSR 500 with an 18 times Canon broadcast lens, and we and we mm. still managed to turn heads with that. So it can still be done. I, I'm a, I am a big believer in you know you could have all the gear in the world and still shoot garbage at the end of the day if you don't know what yeah. you're doing. Because um, that camera doesn't automatically make you a better filmmaker. Not at all. Not at all. And it didn't. It didn't for me. Um, I learned. I learned how to shoot like the way you would with the red with the 5d that was my learning curve for that and i still saw a lot of people out there using the 5d but you know thinking they were doing it in a cinematic way and mm. they weren't and i thought there's still more you can take take it with this um and i still see people now buying the red camera especially on the on the forums and they'll you know there's there's a section called shot on red and it'll be like you know what you've done and 90% of it is like, hey, look, look at look at me. I shot all the yachts coming into the docks the other day. And it's like, you bought it for that. Are you using it commercially? Or yeah, like this, is, this is it. And, so, and a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are, you know, just dudes with a lot of money. And it's their hobby. And they'll just go out. Nice. They'll shoot the occasional music video on it. But even still, I see the music videos. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm the, I'm the be all and end all. But I look at their stuff and I think, you know, you could have got away with doing that with an A7 or yeah. or, uh, or a Canon C100, 200, whatever. There's a what lot it, of options out yeah. there that shoot really high quality stuff. Yeah. Um, one 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 bugbear of uh, quite a lot of people online that I see is when YouTubers are oh. you know, experimenting with God. with with red cameras. And it does just that, oh, it, uh, <laughs> you know, sorry to be rude, but it boils my piss, and because <laughs> the reason is. You know they're getting so much money through monetizing their content. Their mm. mindset is, hey, we've got a tax bill to pay. Let's just buy a red, mm. you know, red weapon at like you know fifty thousand quid or whatever they are these days. And um, it's kind of like you know silk purse sow's ear kind of mentality where it's like you don't need to be shooting that kind of content on that kind of camera. It's I've seen what people about like tech YouTubers who, you know, they shoot with. They shoot in 8K. Yeah. And, uh, I think some of them actually delivering in 8K, but it, it kind of fits a purpose there where yeah. 
obviously they always have the best computers, they have the best phones because yeah. they're in that tech world. And I suppose if you were looking at the red camera in terms of camera tech, it's kind of at the forefront. Yeah. But shooting, uh, essentially what these guys are doing is they're shooting interviews with, with, the, with the best camera in the world or at least the highest resolution camera in the world. And I just don't see the point in that. Mm. Unless you were shooting, say, you know, a very important person, if you were shooting Richard Branson doing an interview, then you'd be like, look, let's get a red in here because yeah. it's such an important deal. But to shoot just you going, hey guys, here's the top 10 weirdest things that ever happened in Transylvania. <laughs> What's the <laughs> point in that if you do that I with an effort? That. That's yeah, quite yeah. <laughs> It's it's meant to be you shoot you shoot high end material with a high end camera. You know you'll get high end results at the back end if you shoot um, low end material with a high end camera. You know what's the point? So what was your reason for buying one? <laughs> or did your mum buy it for you? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I wish. <laughs> I'd have a better car otherwise. Um, my reason was just from coming from those property videos. We got some really great results. We had models. We had makeup. Um, they were quite conceptual, and I just thought I really want to have these high conceptual pieces, but I don't. I don't want to be in a position where I look back and go, "It would have been even better if we'd had a better camera." Yeah. Um, you know, to try and take it as much as possible. I like. I like to. Be, I always like to kind of like you know shoot above my current level, so that I basically you know when someone hopefully when someone sees my work they say, "Oh wow, you know, was that a full team? Was it this? Was it this?" You're like, always it was reaching just, one. Step yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that hopefully people are surprised that it was just me and my camera and, yeah, you know. Well, that kind of investment takes a lot of money and um, you'd saved up the money. Because yeah. I, th I think that's important to talk about is, um, did, you, did you pay for it like all in one go? Like right, I've got, I've got a great anecdote for you here. This is hysterical, <laughs> but I'll talk about that because first. Because it would be wrong um, for filmmakers to get this idea that like, the red camera is the tool for them and yeah. be forever in debt and it not make yeah, money yeah. back for them. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's the first thing is don't expect this camera to make, uh, make you a load of money. I've made a little bit of money off it in terms of renting it out mm. uh, to uh, productions and so forth. But don't be kind of like, oh, I'll, just, I'll rent it out three days a week and that'll pay it off. That won't happen. Yeah. Um, they'll, they'll just go to a big rental house if they're going to rent off you because they've got the stability and security. And but, normally, if you're hiring a red camera, it's a load of other things as well. Yeah. So... You might be able to hire it out to a yeah, self-shooter operator. The, that's it. You can get the body, but then it's like, right, I need a lens, and I need this, and I need a heavy set of legs, and blah blah blah. And so it's like, what's the point? Yeah. In terms of paying for it, yeah, I, I, I bought the actual the camera itself, just the body, the monitor, and everything I needed to get going on it. I bought in one go, yeah. um, and I just saved up and lived on literally nothing, <laughs> which was tough. You know, no yeah. holidays, no yeah. fun. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I think the, one of the funniest anecdotes I ever, I ever saw was um, some dude came on the Red User Forums, and there's a section called Off Topic, and you can talk yeah. about anything you like. And some dude had, had gone on there and gone, and gone hey guys, I wanna, uh, I'm going to set up a Kickstarter to get me a Red. Right? No. <laughs> and I wish that, I looked for the thread the other day because I thought, I want to laugh at this again, but it's gone. And it was basically, no. and, it, and it was this dude. So basically saying, yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to set up a Kickstarter. There'll be rewards. So if you all chip in and help me get my red, I'll shoot stuff for you. And everyone just ripped him apart. You know, <laughs> I was just sat by, what? Oh, this is great. And uh, yeah. you know, they were just saying, how dare you? You know, <laughs> I mean, they were really incensed. How dare you? We've worked for this. We've we've stressed and how how, how you know what I mean? And and he'd gone, oh well, but my mum said it was a good idea, and my friends, and you know, just this kind of like overly. <laughs> Just this overly entitled oh. guy. I'm sure he's from the UK as well. And then in no time at all, that thread disappeared. That was so funny. Oh, but yeah, there, you know, um, you've got to work your backside off of this thing. And, and if someone if someone came up to me and said, Do you work? I guess it depends on the level of stuff you sh you, you're thinking of shooting because they can be a bottomless pit. And, and, yeah. they, and they do make you a little bit snobby. So you kind of go, well, if I'm going to get a tripod, I may as well get the best one I can. If yeah. I'm going to get lenses, I may as well get the best. And before you know it, you've got the best of everything and you're, you're 70,000 quid down or however, however much you've spent on it by the time you're done. So you've got to um, look at what you want to do and plan accordingly. There are cheap ways of achieving what you want. You don't have to get the best every time. Cool, good advice. I think now would be a good opportunity to see what's in your kit bag. Cool. Hey, I said the title of the show on the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give me a second. Should we get rid of the <laughs> forklift truck? Oh, there you go. <laughs> that is a big bag. Okay, let's see it. The beast. 
There it is. Whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, it's quite heavy. It is. It is. Uh, it's, it's something that people aren't prepared for. I wasn't prepared for it when I got it. Um, and trust me, carrying this damn thing around all day quickly gets tiring. So I can see what you're thinking with that form factor. Mm -hmm. Under there somewhere is the sort of, almost the DSLR shape yeah. to it. And you've bought the handle that mm -hmm. does that. You can operate or you can use this without that side handle, can't you? Yeah, yeah, you can do everything from the touch screen. Cool, well, take me through it. Okay, so um, I bought the uh, body. This is the uh, wooden camera top plate, which gives you more uh, mounting points for everything that you need. So there's a top handle here, mm -hmm. and you can obviously slide that left and right. That's nice. Wooden camera makes some great oh, accessories. It's, it's unreal, and the price is really good because the, one of the problems with red is their accessories are everything through the nose. Is expensive. Uh, you can mount the LE, uh, LCD anywhere you like on this system. This is a separate EVF. I didn't get the uh, actual red EVF. Yeah. I'll just um, turn it around. So this is the Zacuto Gretical EVF, which mm -hmm. uh, is a dynamite, dynamite EVF. I'm, I'm really in love with this thing. Um, powered off uh, DTAP and obviously the uh, SDI'd up. And this is another wooden camera system. This is the, the mounting point for it. Yep. I got uh, a Bright Tangerine map box with three stage filters. Everyone loves Bright Tangerine. It is great. It is great. God bless. These are rock solid. Yeah. I gotta I mean, say that. The, the, you know, on, on the videos, they'll stand on them. And yeah. God, God bless those dudes who left <laughs> Ari and set up on their own. Oh, was uh, that it? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. this is, yeah, they did a runner and basically said, oh, we'll do our own thing. So this is a swing away map box. Yeah. Um, you can strip it down if you want it to be lighter. It's a, it's a very compact rig, yeah. I'll say. I've been shooting with the Alexa Mini mm -hmm. recently. Oh, yeah. And you have to, like, stick rails on it to get the battery pack out here <laughs> yeah, because yeah. The, ca the cards come out the back. Yeah, yeah. And what starts off as this really compact rig yeah. ends up having to be as big as a full-size Alexa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing I like about this. It, it, it is a compact system. Yeah. It's... Um... It's, it is great because once, you know, this is about as big as it gets. I mean, you can have the flags on the top as well yeah. if you want to get that out there just for a bit of a flare coverage. But, yeah, I, th I do think in terms of Alexa, you can get it down smaller. Um, wh the weight difference between this and Alexa, I don't know. I've, I've not really used the Alexa very much. I mean, just, no, you know, it is, it is pretty chunky. Uh, and this is where you start getting into the realisation that you're not in 5D territory anymore. Because with the 5D back in the in the good old days, you could just, I keep saying 5D, it's just showing my age here. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, any DSLR, you know, you can just throw them everywhere. Any shot you want, it's so easy to get. And it's not tiring, it's damn easy. This thing, the problem with the red is, you can't just throw this thing around. Uh, you'll get tired out in no time. So you really, it forces you to plan as a proper filmmaker would plan, which is which is a good thing, really. So going back to what we said before, it, in a way, it might make you a better filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, it, it'll it'll definitely make you think about what you're going to do ahead of time because, you know, what, once you've used it two or three times and you realise the limitations of such a large, yeah. compact, chunky camera, you start to think, well, I can't just go in there and get as much coverage as humanly possible, get back and edit something out of that. Everything's got to be considered. Everything's got to be considered. And because, you know, because it's a tall camera as well, or at least taller than, say, a DSLR would be, which mm -hmm. would be about here. So little things like, you know, if you want to get it low to the ground, get a low shot looking up, suddenly you've got to look at a different set of legs because even though a tripod that you've got for your DSLR might go high and then very low and it's an yeah. all-in-one thing, this thing, suddenly it's like, well, I've got to get some large legs, some baby legs, a high hat, um, just to get all those different, different points of view. Yeah. And that's when you need to plan ahead. Otherwise, you're going to get there on the day and you're going to be like, I can't get down lower yeah. than I'd like or I can't go higher than I'd like. Oh, but funnily enough, I've got a 5D in me back. Shall we just go and use that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, well, let's fire this camera up and see the way it works. Okay. Sounds noisy when it does this when you first start it up. It's like a, it's like a microwave. It's got the hairdryer on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the jokes that you'll pull out on set when we use them. You can pull out a little baked potato and go, there you go. Yeah, it's a little microwave oven. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's a... Popsy ping. <laughs> it's a 30-second it's a, it's a startup. I was considering upgrading this to the next model, which is the Epic W, which is 
uh, either a 6K or an 8K sensor, depending on what you like. And this is? And this is 6K. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's much uh, less noisy in higher ISOs. It's lighter. It's, uh, what else does it do? It shoots ProRes right out the back, whereas this doesn't. This right. shoots only R3Ds, Red Raw system. Um, I did look into it, but it was one of them where I thought, if I get this upgrade, I'm going to be poor again for a whole year, yeah. and I'm sick of it. <laughs> so it was one of them where I thought, at, at the end of the day, this thing still creates phenomenal images. Um, and you know the R3D workflow. Yeah, yeah. It's, that red workflow. It's great because it got really good when Adobe picked it up. And I think Final Cut has as well, but I'm not sure. Um, so, so you can just drop those. You can just drop them right in it. It'll native R3D. It'll it'll na uh, uh, native editing for R3D files. The only thing you do need is a RAID array because, uh, as counterintuitive as this sounds, if you put the files on your own internal hard drive in your computer, mm. it'll have trouble with them. For some reason, it's actually faster going Thunderbolt to a RAID array than it is your own internal drive. I have no idea why. This is all a bit over my head, yeah. <laughs> because obviously I shoot with my C100, uh, an RX100 Mark V. They both shoot onto SD cards, yeah, uh, and I get sweet little MP4 files out of those. <laughs> I jam it straight into my computer, I drop it in the timeline, and it yeah. works. And if I want to do some like light colour grading yeah, or something, yeah. if I'm feeling a bit adventurous, <laughs> you know, I, I can do that. Now... This is a completely different system. So yes. just like loosely talk about RAW and what the, and what so, that like to work with. RAW for for those who who don't know what RAW is. Um, normally, when a camera records from the sensor, it'll get processed and then that delivers your final image. Whereas the the red system and working in the exact same way as a lot of uh, cameras will uh, takes the direct information right off the sensor. It doesn't it doesn't compress it. It doesn't mess with it. Gives you that you take it back and it gives you a lot more leeway in post. Mm. So you'll get a whole load of sliders on there and you can change your white balance in post. You can change your exposure plus or minus about two to three stops. Uh, you can change your ISO, all as if you'd done it on the day. Mm. So it gives you a lot more latitude there. But uh, as I mentioned before, you need a much better hard drive system to take care of it. Right. If you've got that set up, you're dropping right on your timeline and you can play with them as though it was off one of these other cameras, came off an SD card. I was, use, yeah. I was using an A7R2, yours the other day. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that, it was funny, I was thinking at the time, there's not much difference between editing this and editing uh, the red, really. It's, it's a big misconception. I think people are terrified yeah. of the whole red raw yeah. system. I think because they don't get it. And they think, oh, I'm going to have to change how I work. It's like, well, you don't really. As long as you've got the hard drive sorted out, and it's fast enough to take the data rate. It's absolutely easy and I think I think it's great it gives you much more options in the grade um, you can really mess up a shot yeah, and kind of yeah. save it <laughs> yeah absolutely I mean it's I equate it to you know if you look at like a, a low budget DSLR grading it is like trying to paint on tissue paper this mm. is like trying to paint on a really thick canvas just nice. gives you so much to you know there's so much there so much data there that you can push and pull it and it never falls apart not unless you do something severe to it but I've, I've yet to I've yet to do that. I've yet to really push it to its limits. Cool. So you operate this camera through the screen pretty much. Mm -hmm. It is like the sort of uh, Black Magic systems. Yeah. Have sort of, I don't want to say copied, but they they use that as well. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a little bit of a learning curve for anyone coming from an ENG background where the camera has a million and one different buttons yeah, on yeah. it. It but, sits on your shoulder. Yeah, but you can do it from this, from the side handle. Okay. So these are all programmable buttons. Let's spin that round yep. to this all, one. All these buttons can be programmed. There's, there's, is there eight on that side and then four at the top here? Yeah. You can set them to anything you want. So currently I've got them set to, you know, bring up the ISO for me, bring up uh, uh, white balance. Yep. I, um, what else have I got on there? Um, uh, punching in. Yep. to HD to get to get a focal check um, and I, I do still use this for quite a lot There's, the right. only time I'll use the screen is if I'm setting uh, resolution frame rate things like that so in a way it's kind of like just working with any camera system that has the additional monitor on yeah because you could take this off and just use the hand grip as absolutely yeah. to, to work with it yeah and just and just check your, your through the viewfinder and you can get all the, all the signal you're getting through here. You can get through the viewfinder so you can see what the, uh, as well as it just being a straight SDI, giving you just the image alone. Mm. You can get all the data as well from, you know, the actual menu system will appear on the, yeah. on the EVF too.
So let's talk about data. How much how much data is coming out of this camera? Oh, uh, God. Get, the, uh, get the mini I'll, mags I'll, out. I'll get a mag out. So, okay. So these are the mini mags. That's rock solid. Though. Rock solid. I think it's uh, aluminium they're made of. Right. And, and they just slot into the side they here. Sl uh, right into that side bit. So what size is this? So that is uh, 512 gig, which will last at 6K. Uh, it depends which compression mode you put on. I usually leave compression at about 8 to 1, which is what everybody does. 8 to 1 compression ratio, 6K, you're looking at 50 minutes. Uh, for 512 gig. So, as we were talking earlier, like when you buy this camera, you've got to get bigger tripods mm -hmm. and things like that. You also yeah. have to get, you're going through a lot more drives. Yeah. And your computer's going to be working through intense data. Absolutely. So that's kind of got to keep up with it as well. That's it. Because I've got a 32 terabyte RAID array and I'm quickly filling that up. So, you know, in terms of storing it, you know, so a lot of people will use the LTE uh, tape systems, yeah. which a lot of offices use for, for big data backup. That's something I'll probably look at down the line. But, you know, until I fill up that drive, I'm, I'm okay. But, yeah, um, storage can be an issue. You can, if you want to, take the R3Ds and just convert them all to ProRes, which a lot of people will do. The new line of cameras, they do They ProRes shoot ProRes internal. right out the back, yeah, internal. And that's kind of like a, a nice little upgrade. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's again it depends it's great for people who are making things like documentaries but with that you're baking in a look file no no, no. You, you're not you? you're not baking in a look you will still get um so like this at the minute if you put an lut on there and manage to uh convert uh, convert it to prores it won't it won't bake the lut in not unless you tell it to the lut is literally just for guide It'll appear on the monitor. You'll see yeah. a, you know, a little one light -like color correction that you'll set up as an LUT, and you go, oh, that looks cool. It's more as a guide so that you, you don't over or underexpose it for the grade later on. Yeah. But it will always deliver out the back end completely flat R3Ds uh, with all the shadows flattened. It, it can sometimes look a little underwhelming when you see it. Yeah. Because you get it, you're like, I, uh, yeah, yeah. From raw to and you're like, is that it? And then once <laughs> you've done playing with it, though, in the grade, that's when it comes alive. So it's definitely a camera. A camera system designed to be manipulated it's not meant to be straight out the back is ready to ready to roll with footage it's meant to be played with okay so what resolution did this shoot did you say 6k so it shoots 6k mm -hmm. so there's a bit of like it's not a competition but there's a lot of uh, camera manufacturers that are now coming out with red with their yeah. 8k sensor yeah, yeah sony have just released the venice with that's right. the 6k sensor yeah, yeah. is that that's right yeah um a lot of people are quite happy with HD, mm -hmm. and a lot of projects get finished in HD. Yeah. So what would be your reasoning, or how does it help you on a shoot going with 6K, for instance? Well, there's a big misconception, because I'll, I'll mention sometimes to people, and they'll say, why do you need 6K? We've, we've, we've not even got 4K TVs out properly yet, yeah. and they think that you need to have a 6K delivery system to be able to appreciate 6K, and you really don't. Right. Uh, if you shoot in 6K, one thing is once you've compact, compacted a 6K file down into a 4K file, mm. it looks better than it than if you'd shot 4K yeah. in the first place. And the second thing is you get you get a little bit more leeway. So if you shoot in 6K full frame on this camera, it's like having a margin all around your image. Yeah. So when you get back, if you kind of think, oh, if only the the camera had been moved like a few inches to the right. You can do it. You can just drag it along. You'll eventually see the black bar of the end of the frame, but it'll give you that margin just to move it around and recompose a little bit. Isn't this David Fincher's method for not taking as many takes on House of Cards or something? It was like if the dolly doesn't quite hit the mark yeah. and the actor isn't quite in the, yeah, in the yeah. frame line, he can then you can You can recompose, it, yeah. Which I think all his crew members would be like, hallelujah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true, but at the same time, you can you also become a snob when it comes to the 6K image because as much as it's great to have that that you can move around, there's part of you that's like, I don't want to have to. You know, I really want to get it right and nailed on the day because you start yeah. wanting that extra res. You never want to... There are some people who will shoot something with this and say, okay, there's my 6K image and I can punch in yeah. and get a medium shot in 4K. I hate doing that. So there's an opportunity with this camera to almost become a lazy filmmaker because yeah. you're like, oh, I can reframe it in post. Absolutely. I can change the colours here, there and everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Has that happened with you? No. Are, are any of the clients watching? <laughs> not at all. No. Not, not at all. And just simply because 
you, you, you wind up loving the 6K image that much. You don't want to distort it. Yeah. And you don't want to, and you, you, you know, you start to realize as well how different lenses will work with that 6K image. Yeah. So if you were shooting, if you were shooting someone talking a dialogue scene and you shot it with a 50 mil lens, and then you just went, oh, the hell with this, I'll just punch in later on, and that'll give me two angles. Yeah. So I'll have a 50, and by zooming in, it'll effectively make it an 85 as well. You get annoyed where you think, hang on, I know what an 85 mil lens will look like on that sensor, yeah. and it would have looked amazing. Yeah. So I don't want to cheat it, because I know that if I just put in that extra effort, it'll look amazing. The extra effort of swapping out a lens. Yeah, just swapping out a lens. <laughs> <laughs> So there are people who do it. Like I said, there's people on the red forums who say, hey, I shot this the other day, and mm. because I had 8K or 6K to work with, it cut my day in half. And I'm like, well, why don't you just like shoot a full day? And yeah. You know what I mean? Well, certain get, get circumstances, stuff. or I think we were talking yeah, about like high-profile interview situations, yeah. um, you can get a number of shots yeah. out of your one shot. If somebody's doing a piece to camera, yeah. there's not much opportunity to get another Absolutely, uh, yeah. camera in yeah. without the eye line changing. That's right, yeah. So... There's, there's some examples where yeah. that can be used really but well. But the other thing to bear in mind is the red has a certain level of noise over its sensor. If you're zooming in to the sensor, you're zooming into the noise, so the noise becomes more prevalent. So if you shoot this camera at 4K, it will be a noisier image than if you'd shot it at 6K. So that's so another thing to bear in mind. you're referring to you can crop the sensor. Yeah, that's so that's what you're doing. So you can shoot in 6K. Yeah. Okay, I'll, yeah. here's my diagram. <laughs> so you can shoot 6K. When it goes to 4K... You're actually cropping that that's image. That's right, yeah. So and it, it, 2K. That's it. It changes not only your depth of field, it changes your field of view. It changes the way lenses will work with, with the sensor. It's something that I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of. Some people don't mind doing it at all. But again, I, I have shot this camera at 4K just to play around with it, see mm. what it looked like. And I thought, oh, it's a slightly messier image. Uh, that's me pixel peeping. You, you're cropping but, into that noise, as you're yeah. saying, and you're... Whatever issues there are with the lens, you're zooming in on those issues. Those issues are becoming larger and larger the more you zoom into it. So as a, some of the do's and don'ts with this camera, one would be always shoot at max resolution? Yeah, I think so. Because, what's, you know, again, what's the point? If, you, if you're not going to shoot it, if you're not going to use it for what it is, you're probably using the wrong camera. There are some people who, who probably would disagree, who say, yeah. oh, I run a production company and all we do is 4K and everything's a 4K setup and it's fine and we don't mind doing that. Uh, again, I, it's, I think it's just the snob in me. <laughs> and two things that it doesn't have, mm -hmm. internal NDs. Yeah, that's right. So, hence the matte box, the matte and you've box. probably got a filter set. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a set of, I think it'll, yeah, I have a set of Schneider NDs, which I don't have with me, but uh, they go in there. Um, I prefer it to be honest. Internal NDs, I'm not, you know, to me that says more uh, ENG type yeah, camera. Yeah. I don't know why people complain about it so much. Again, people on the red forums, like I'd say three quarters of them desperate for internal NDs. But I, I, again, I keep thinking the same thing. This is a, a digital 35 millimeter camera. You know, this is for film sets for the most part. Yeah. Why would you, you know, why would you want an ENG setup? You know, if, if that's what you want, get an ENG camera with internal uh, ND filters. But I do think it offers more flexibility in getting them outside anyway. You can play around with lenses a lot more. And then, no microphone. No microphone. No, the uh, the latest version has scratch mics nice. uh, at the bottom, like just at the base here. There's two scratch mics for syncing audio. This is designed for clapper boards. Uh, I've just, I just did a shoot this weekend where we had external sound and we were clappering, clappering the whole thing. Yeah. Um, again, I've never run into an issue with it. I'm used to syncing sound and video up all the time, and I'd yeah. rather shoot. I'd, ra I'd rather shoot them separately every single time. Even when I'm doing DSLR stuff, I have a separate sound recorder, and I prefer just doing the whole thing separately. I don't know why; it sets my mind at ease. So people coming from that A7S, 5D background, yeah, they wouldn't find that transition too hard. And also working with NDs, absolutely, yeah. that, it's, it's very similar. Yeah. If you're from a strong photographic background, or or at least you're aware of it, you will you'll you, you I think you take to this camera like a duck to water. I don't think there's a huge learning curve with it. I do think you'd find it harder if you'd come from a purely ENG world. If you'd never used a DSLR yeah. and all you'd used was uh, say a Sony C, uh, a Canon C100 or or the equivalent, um, you'd probably be a bit more baffled by this thing. It's definitely designed for. You know, its own internal digital dark room. It's designed. It's designed for that. Mm. I, I 
I mi mix between the two worlds. So a lot of my stuff is shooting with FS7, C100, mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, Alexa Minis yeah. and Reds um, for short film work. And I understand what I'm coming into and sort of prepare myself mentally before I'm getting in into that shoot. Mm -hmm. And I, I can kind of adjust fairly well yeah. between them. But when I'm back and forth between the two, there's yeah. features that I absolutely love on this that I wish they were on yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And features on them that I wish I could work faster. But you've just got to get your mindset into yeah. working with that camera. You can become greedy. Uh, I mean, God knows, <laughs> I wish this thing was lighter. I wish it saw in the dark. I wish it was as we easy to use. Want yeah, so I, much more. I wish it was as easy to use as the Sony DSLRs, but that's generations away, you know. So, but what what at the end of the day, this this camera delivers is a fundamentally amazing looking image. The R three D red raw system, you know, the red log film look on its own. The color science involved in that is just something else, and you know, I think people can sometimes look at the black magic systems or or even what the, what Sony are doing and go yeah but you get the same and it's like that's what you're paying for for a lot of this you're paying for the color science there's something about it it pops yeah. it really does pop in the same way 35 mil film does and that's what you've got to look for we should probably mention that one thing that uh red has is a great community yeah or absolutely. A, a very hmm, how should we say it's a big community yeah whether it's friendly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of them. Some people on there are fantastic. Some people try to treat it like a bit of a men's club. Yeah. And if you don't have the ultimate red, the, you know, you're not worth talking to. There are four, five, maybe six regulars on there. And out of those regulars, there's, there's only one that I've known that I can see who consistently delivers amazing work. There's a guy called Mark Toyer. And that guy, he's, oh, he's, he's the guy on that recent, well, one of the adverts where he was like, oh, yeah, uh, I had to test out the new sensor, so I just got in my chopper and flew around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he is so just like flippant with his access to like million dollar production. <laughs> but he's cool though, because I mean, yeah. the good thing about him is he will shoot high end, but he will also just go out with one of these on a monopod and just shoot like a fun fair near where he lives and get some cool stuff. The good thing about the forums is usually if you have a question, someone will answer it. That's the great thing. Um, there's access to kit. So maybe Red are selling this handle at a ridiculous markup. Someone will know a company that you've never heard of who will, sh who will be selling it at a tenth of the price. Mm. And that's the good thing. Uh, you've got access to a world of knowledge out there from all these guys. And also just little issues with the camera. You know, I've, I've had issues. I've thought, oh, God, is this a big thing? And they've been, no, no, you've just got this set wrong here. And then before you know it, it's easily fixed. Um, the only thing to bear in mind with the Red uh, guys is they can be very technical with the camera. So it becomes less about what you're shooting and more about how you're shooting it. Because in a way, it's a computer system. It is. It, at the end of the day, this is a PC. Um, but the, the, the problem is they become so bogged down with the technicalities of how it looks. You might look, I might shoot something and think that looks absolutely amazing, and someone might go, yeah, that looks amazing. But they may look at it and go, Phew. That's overexposed, that's underexposed, you've got a bit of noise in your blue channel, you've got this, and it's like, it doesn't matter, it just looks good. Sometimes, yeah. something that looks good, that's all you need. So, because they're thinking about it too much in a technical exactly, way. Exactly, they're rather. thinking about it too much, they're trying to get this thing primed to shoot as optimal as possible, and sometimes, you get. I, I've, I've had shots where I've thought on the day, ah, oh, I messed that up, I know I did, that's yeah. slightly blown out, or it's underexposed, and I've got back and I've saved it, it's like, wow, that's a cool shot. But they'd be like, no, it's got to get thrown away, because this is wrong, and that's wrong, and... That's the only thing you've got to bear in mind with those guys. They can be a bit funny. Do you want to just talk about that Bentley commercial? Yeah. Uh, the spec commercial, we'll call it. <laughs> <laughs> the spec. Um, yeah, that was cool. So basically, I worked on that with Mike Stanaforth and yourself, and... Uh, I met Mike, um, I don't even know, it was a good nine months or so ago, maybe longer than that. And basically, we just said, you know, it'd be cool to work on, on some good some good material. So I said, do you fancy doing a spec commercial? He came back to me and said, Justin at Big Shed, Big Shed, wicked place to go, was potentially going to let us in for a weekend if we could think of something to use. So we went to see him, and he happened to have a rotating car rotator. 
so you could stick a character, you know. It was rad. It was, it was, it was cool. <laughs> oh, man, it was scary. Um, so, you know, we were like, well, okay, we'll do a car commercial. Uh, Mike had access to these encapsulites, these big, long tubes. Yeah. They, they look like fluorescent tubes, but they're LEDs. The scariest thing with that was getting it on the rotating turntable. Turn it took us three and a half hours. <laughs> And we had, I think, about five mil of clearance because the rotating hub, the rotating uh, spinner thing has got a hub on it. And the car has to go over that hub. Now, most cars are fine because they've got plenty of clearance. This thing's so low to the ground. Yeah. So we had five mil of clearance. <laughs> so three and a half hours. And I can still remember Mike. Like that, watching me drive around. Right, right, take your fingers away from your mouth. <laughs> it was a fantastic shoot. You know, uh, we had Dan Tunstall there as the gaffer. Justin was helping out. We had yourself as AC. Um, it was it was brilliant. It, it, the actual shoot itself, once we'd done dressing the set, getting the car on there and everything, went really easily. It was yeah. actually a really chilled out set, and it was and it was it got to the point where we still had a tiny bit of time left, but it was like I literally can't think of anything else to shoot. We shot it we, inside, we, we outside, got spinning it, round, hundred percent covered. Um, and when when it was all edited and completed, uh, I was really happy with it. Usually, I always come back from an edit and go. Oh, God, I could have grabbed a shot here and yeah, I could have got that. But it, I was more. literally like, I don't know what else I could have done with this. Because once the car was rotating and the red was in place, mm. you were getting a rotation, you know, multiple rotations. So it's like, instead of having to do numerous setups around the car, the car was doing your setups for yeah. you just by rotating. So you could put the camera in one position, rotate it, another lens, rotate it. And it's just giving you multiple, multiple looks. And then in post, we did some funky... Uh, Edit was so cool. Yeah, we did some funky mirror things, so it looked like it was unfolding from itself. And um, had some, had some, uh, we had uh, Standby Productions helping us out with that. Uh, Jack, Jack Warman. Uh, he was cool. He, he, he really busted, him, busted his ass on that one. He did a great job for us. Awesome. Well, that's been a great insight into the Red Digital Cinema. Red Dragon Epic something or other. <laughs> <laughs> the names are so confusing. It's a sweet camera. Thanks for watching and see you the next time. Right, shall we have a beer then? Yeah, screw it. Hang on. Should we do this in 5K? Well, we can do it in 6K. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? We're now in 6K. <laughs> there we go. It's cheers. A, cheers, man. I just hope we look better and not worse, you know? Yeah, that's the danger. Like, you can see more resolution around someone's face and yeah, see yeah. how ugly they are. You know, you just... Yeah. Sucking your gut. All right, yeah. <laughs> how do you think that went, then? Yeah, it was good. You actually chill out, That man. was actually really good, yeah. No, no. That was... Uh, <sighs> I don't know how long it's going to be. And pizza. Everybody thought my uh, vlog was originally going to be about pizzas. Why? Uh, because I love pizzas. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all on my original uh, original vlogs. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. it'd be great to have a Domino's here while we were doing this. It'd be all over my face, though. Damn it! Why didn't I think of that? Okay, so maybe there's a comparison to see there, the C100 between. Yeah. What's well, your camera again? Red Epic, Red, Red Epic Red, Dragon. Red Epic Dragon. Mm -hmm. Red Epic Dragon. Such a cool name, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, does it look any better? I, I mean, suppose a real test would be there, but we haven't got a well, tripod the, with us. I know. The, the problem is the LCD sometimes aren't quite as true as what you're actually getting. So, and the, is the focus peaking on that? Yeah. So yeah, we're kind it's, of it's looking pink at the minute. Pinky, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is that one? Yeah. I mean, that is the good thing with that is I don't ever have to use focus peaking. Hang on, great. let's crop in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, it's still a great image. Do you want to do that? Do you want to crop in so you can see what you are? Uh, I'm going to do it in post. Oh, okay. You yeah. know, fix it in post. Oh, that's the point. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, 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 that's what you're doing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Cool. So how do people find you? Uh, so I have, yeah, yeah, I'm on Instagram. It's uh, David Ellison Films. Uh, my website is davidellisonfilms.com. Uh, you can find me on Vimeo, 